Welcome back to another episode of our podcast series for event planners. My name is Savannah McIntosh, marketing director and host of the Event Buzz podcast by Purple Pass. I am so excited to be introducing our next guest, Andrea Ramsey, an executive producer with 20 plus years of experience activating large scale B2B and B2C live events. Activations have spanned Super Bowls to national political conventions and clients, including Google and Nike. Through her years in live events, she has become a vocal advocate for event safety, not solely focused on this current pandemic challenged world, but across all possible risks on site. While the industry shut down, she also founded a consultancy on health and safety for live events with another experienced producer. In this episode, we will be discussing the new health and safety guidelines emerging that are leaving event professionals unsure of how to move forward as events open back up plus concerns over safety when it comes to experiential marketing events and the progression of events in the era of COVID-19. Thanks for coming on to the Event Buzz podcast. How are you doing this morning? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I am super excited to talk with you today. I think what we're going to cover is something of interest for all our event planners. So let's get started. Can we just have you give a little bit of background about yourself to the listeners who you are and maybe touch on what your professional journey has been like during the pandemic. Sure. So I began in events like a lot of people um, when it was a little bit newer, um, uh, sort of by accident. I just fell into it. I had a, a summer internship at a production company, but they focused on concerts and music. And um, they also had an arm that was doing this strange thing called live events. Um, their live event team did marketing tours. So it was sort of over the road tours, sampling, things like that. And I was in grad school and kind of kept going back and forth and helping them out. And then um, once I finished uh, grad school, they had me come in and work on a, an event they were doing that was um, very unexpected. It was um, the pastoral visit of Pope John Paul II to St. Louis, mm-hmm. Missouri. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they made me the assistant director of protocol and, um, it, they had been planning for something like four years for a three-day event. Um, wow. I only came in in the last maybe six months. Yeah. Um, but it was great fun and it was very eye opening for me. And so when it was finished, they said, you have an aptitude for staying calm home in chaos. We have this event marketing arm. Um, you should work with them. And they recommended me to someone and I ended up kind of on my first event marketing tour. So wow. I did touring and then I started doing, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Um, you realize that no matter where you go, if you're on a marketing tour, people have basically five jokes that they will say about whatever your product or your vehicle is. Uh-huh. And they all think they're coming up with it right away at the same time. So it can get tedious, but when you're, you know, young, you're 24, 25, um, that was way fun. So I remember they gave us um, $25 a day in per diem and I thought I was rich. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I really did. And we had to share hotel rooms. So it was, um, it was just, it was a big deal. It was really fun. Um, And then I started working with some other companies and did some programming that was not based, not sampling based, started doing bigger B2C events and did some, you know, you do some meetings, you do some conventions, you do all kinds of different things. So mm-hmm. I worked for um, agencies for quite a while. I did get recruited from by one of my clients. I worked on the client side for a couple of years and then I decided to go freelance. Um, and so I've been freelance ever since. So it's been a, it's been great fun. Um, yeah. And I feel like there's always something new to learn. It's, um, and, and I don't know your experience, but I, I'm sure that you have the, um, have multiple times had to really drill down and explain to people, even maybe like me, your mom, uh, what you do. And they oh, still gosh. Don't quite get it, right? No, I know. Right? <laughs> I totally can relate. I'm just like, it's not even worth it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's just social media. There you go. <laughs> exactly. I, at one point, heard my mom tell someone and I had just done um, something huge at the Super Bowl. Um, 
And she was like, well, she, it's like driving the Wienermobile. Oh, and I was like, you know what? driving the Wienermobile is, that's a great gig. And I'm not going to knock it. That's funny. But that's not what I do. And thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> I just moved on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I totally relate. It's, it's really it's hard. hard. It's so complex. People don't it know is. And, you know, it is also in the middle of a pandemic. It's also hard to explain to people when you realize mm-hmm. well, I'm not curing anything. It yeah. really is marketing. Like, I'm really just trying to get you to buy something. Let's yeah. just nail it that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And how has it been this year? I, you've, been, you've been doing a lot since the pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, as a freelancer, the pandemic definitely, um, you know, it shut everybody down. So like many people, I got a, a random phone call. You know, on March 13th that said, could this be your last day of this contract? Um, yeah. And I did not fault them. I wasn't upset about it. I just said, yeah, that's great. You know, like yeah. I, I have one more day to finish expenses. I get this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so um, everything sort of dried up. Um, and it, my business partner and I, Hillary Cartwright, um, we have, when I did my stint on the client side, uh, she was my agency contact. And so that's how we met. And mm-hmm. then we had worked through multiple agencies together on multiple projects. So we became co-workers. And we had always talked about doing something together. And suddenly, I definitely had the time to focus on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did know that every time we did a project together, we noted that we were the only ones that cared about sustainability, um, or at least the passion level that we had to really try to make things work. And we also seemed to be just a little bit more concerned about safety than a lot of um, other folks that were activating around us. Mm -hmm. So um, it just seemed, we had been talking about this and it just seemed really natural um, to then kind of move that into, hey, let's take some classes together. Let's do some training. Let's do all of these things. And we started doing research and through research and training, we got introduced to some medical professionals and, um, you know, social epidemiologists, just some people that were so generous with their knowledge because they were interested in what we did. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we were really able to um, kind of translate what we did with their expertise and start kind of figuring out, you know, what we could do is this, what we could do is that. And uh, so we learned quite a bit um, about what we could be doing in safety and not just pandemic focused, although the pandemic certainly heightened our interest in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were able to really um, kind of get really deep into uh, what does it look like to be safe on an event site on things well beyond just you know respiratory safety. Um, and so we decided let's make this, this is a consultancy. This isn't just interest. We had lots of friends calling us and saying, hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? So we were able to give some information. And so it was just, it was very natural. Um, I was a freelancer, so I had the time to do it. Hillary actually um, was very safe in a job. Um, I think, you know, relatively unlikely to be laid off in the the current climate, uh, but decided to make the leap. And so actually left her, her agency world so that we would be able to focus on this full time. Awesome. And what is the organization called? I just want to make sure people know. Oh, sure. Our company is called The Event Ally. Um, mm-hmm. and we call it TEA for short. Um, but it's interesting how many people don't understand the word <laughs> ally, A-L-L-Y. I will get <laughs> The Event Alley quite a bit. And I'm like, nope, it's... <laughs> That word is ally. (laughs) That's funny. That's so awesome. It's so important. Exactly what you're saying. Like we need it, even though the pandemic might have brought it to our attention. It's so important to have even beyond once we move past COVID and everything. Exactly. Uh And with that in mind, since we're talking about everything you guys are doing, I wanted to touch on currently it seems like as we move forward and it does depend on the state and where you're at and what you're planning, all this stuff, we constantly are seeing new emerging safety guidelines released every day. I wanted to ask 
if you've noticed or seen some of the biggest challenges for event professionals when it comes to these safety guidelines? Sure. Can be emergency safety guidelines. Well, one of the things that I think is easiest to remember with people is that um, a lot of people, when they say, well, this safety guideline says this, this safety guideline says that, what they're really talking about are restrictions. Mm -hmm. So this restriction in this geography says, I can't do this. This one says I can. And a restriction is not the same as a safety guideline. So we go with the experts. Um, and for better or worse, um, and, and I think for better, they're a great organization. I mean, the CDC really sort of needs to be the North Star in the United States. Yeah. We go with what their guidelines are. Their guidelines may be restrictive, and sometimes they're a little convoluted. They try to allow for interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, in certain areas, but it's really the difference in the guidelines is really the difference between what you can do versus what you should do. Yeah. So they're trying to push things to, um, a lot of it is personal responsibility and choice. Yeah. To allow for that. And so that is what can be difficult for us as event professionals to say, okay, well, you know, the CDC is saying, People should still wear masks in these situations. And again, the information can be very, very convoluted. It's very, it's starting to get very granular about yeah. how far away you be if you're inside or if you're outside. So again, I know that that can be difficult. But if you read their restrict or their guidelines, then you get to a place like the state of Texas, which says no mask mandates. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean um, you should do that. It means you can do that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so then you start to get into, okay, so I have the freedom legally to be able to do something um, that science or the, the experts are saying, you know, it's, it's not the safest option. And that I, I liken that to, you know, there, there are some states that don't have seatbelt laws. There are some states that don't have helmet laws. If you're on a motorcycle, mm -hmm. um, you are allowed to do that. That's your personal choice, but it is, it's, you know, regarding safety, we all know it's safer to wear your seatbelt and wear a helmet mm -hmm. on, on a motorcycle. Not at the same time, obviously. So yeah. that's a good um, Yeah. So then you you really have to get into, and and I think this is something that we as marketers we do know, which is two different identities, which is what is the brand's identity and what is your agency identity? Um, and I think if you as an agency have an existing client, you probably already mesh with them pretty well on, you know, we agree um, on how far we want to go on certain things. So your identities probably match, but they may not. So you need to understand as an employer or employee, here is where I want to be. I am nervous to go out. I am not nervous at all. I am, I want to be as safe as humanly possible. I want everybody around me tested. I want to stay in my room, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Understanding what that is as an agency and what you'll expect your employees to do. And then understand what your brand is asking to do. If you have a brand that says, hey, you know what? Um, there's no mask mandate in Texas. And we are thrilled with that. We want to be somewhere. We want no one wearing um, masks mm -hmm. of our staff. We don't want, um, you know, we don't we don't like that look. We don't think that that's the best. Yeah. Then you kind of as an agency have to say, well, that is a a can. Is it a should? Um, I tend to lean towards public health uh, and the experts and go with the uh, what you should do. Uh, what is the the, the safest? Um, and we, as the event ally, always lean towards the most restrictive, safest recommendations and then talk that through with our clients and say, okay, this is the, the most restrictive option that, you know, it is showing your duty of care is really taken care of and that you have been as restrictive as possible to keep people safe. Yeah. But legally, you are allowed to do A, B, and C. And so this is how you can back out of it. But you know, I think that we've seen with the slowdown in events, you know, what happened um, over the past, over yeah. a year, um, I think we've seen that most brands, or at least 
really big brands went with caution. Yeah. They would continue to do so. Um, yeah. 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 Texas is a good example. <laughs> I actually, I'm from California, but I currently live in Texas. So I understand okay. it's like two different worlds. I'm visiting really home, home right now. And so I, yeah, it's different, but it's funny you bring that up because I just talked to uh, an event planner actually, and they just hosted an event in Texas and I didn't realize this, but he was saying that they wanted to do masks and they had it on all the promotional stuff. Okay. Mask required. And whoever they talked to told them a representative in Texas that they cannot say required. It's, you know, they can't make masks mandatory, I guess now in Texas, which I like, would have to, I don't know. That's what he was saying. Yeah, I was like, I that blows verify. My yeah. I'd have to verify that with some research, but yeah. In my understanding, if you are hosting a private event, um, you're allowed to make it restrictive. That's you what I was I mean? thinking too. Yeah, I don't understand that. So it, possibly it was a public event. I, I don't. I don't know. understand it, but like that's right. something that they would say in Texas. Like, yeah, yeah, um, and that's partially what is such a problem for all of us in the events right now. Is that mm -hmm. well, I heard this, I heard that, yeah, and. Um, we do have to investigate every individual claim like that mm -hmm. because it doesn't seem to be sort of this handbook of, so there's the safety stuff, but then there's also just like the legal, what can I do in that geography? I know. And that's, that's a big bummer. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's really confusing and I feel bad for everyone trying to navigate all this stuff because like you said, everyone's saying different things and yeah. It's absolutely definitely the, the safety yeah. guidelines actually they can get convoluted but they do remain pretty consistent if mm -hmm. you go with uh, the cdc the who etc um, yeah they, they are they're pretty consistent it is when you get into the legality of things and these are not these are not scientists these are not medical experts making these rules yeah um and so you know then then you have to start getting into that and that's something that we've found is we're also guiding so many of our clients to include people that they just never thought to include in their production planning phase. Yeah. Um, they are talking to their insurance agents. Their lawyer is attached to the hip with them now. Um, and then, you know, people like HR, I would never have considered unless I needed staff mm -hmm. keeping HR really heavily involved. But when you start talking about things like vaccines and medical records, you have to have them on your team. So it's a, it's a larger team that's required oh, yeah. to figure all of this out. Uh, yeah. And, and again, back to Texas, I think about brands and like, what would you say for a brand that wants to be safe and wants to do everything as restricted and safely as possible, but then it's hard because that's going to turn off people in that state that don't, you know, want to be like, that's, not what they believe in. They want to, don't want to wear masks. They don't believe they should be mandated. Like, what do you, how do you kind of, how would you market? What would you give advice for that type of brand well, or event? And I would say that's, that's kind of your third thing. So, you know, your agency and your, your client, you know, your brand ID mm -hmm. and you understand your demographic. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're going to be as restrictive as possible and try to do an event in Austin, Texas, that's really different than literally anywhere else in Texas. Um, yeah, I live in love Austin, Missouri. And if you want to do an event in St. Louis and be very restrictive with distancing yeah. and um, masks, you will probably be more successful, although not perfectly so, than um, you would be in more rural or southern parts of Missouri, which are incredibly resistant to yeah. the restrictions. They have very different, um, there are differences in lives and in demographics, you know, that you need to understand. So as long as your client really knows their, um, their clients, you know, their demographic of who yeah. will be coming, um, that will also probably be a guide, not so much how you activate the event, mm -hmm. um, but just the, you know, the starting point, the risk assessment, should we even do it? Because if you want to be really restrictive and you're going to go to a place where people just will not adhere to that then you're just going to be antagonizing your audience and it's it's not you know the juice is not worth the squeeze on that yeah that's a good point it's crazy 
just from this past year, now we do have to do our demographic research, but the research is, is so much more complex. And we're looking at different things. Like you said, who's willing to go and who's going to be resistant. And just so that your team is growing. Like we, there's so many different roles now that people have to play. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I said, one of the, the specialists that we work with is a, a social epidemiologist. And, um, I could legitimately listen to her talk all day. She just, the poor lady is probably like, these guys stop calling me about this. Um, but she does, uh, you know, updates and educational points for us and we yeah. follow what she's doing. And by social epidemiology, she really studies what people are doing in response to this and what the, you know, her, her point has been in disease progression. Mm-hmm. The wild card is human behavior. And so, um, you know, we've really delved deeply into that understanding what crowds look like, what the makeup of them that looks like? Um, and how do you address that? Um, how will you make it work? You know, what what can you do to um, connect people and, and make sure they understand that the shared experience is also a shared responsibility? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you, you work through that with your clients and, you know, there are lots of little tips and tricks to kind of do, again, based on who your demographic is. Yeah. Yeah. And for everyone listening, you guys have amazing resources on your website, which I'll link to this so people can check it out. I was just scanning through it quickly and you you guys have already made so many points that I see come up a lot, a lot of different questions that come up because people don't really know how to look at it, the safety standpoint. So yeah, you guys have awesome resources. And I I also wanted to touch on, because you mentioned in the beginning, sustainability, you guys are not really people talk about sustainability concerns, especially when it comes to events, which is really important. And I was just wondering if we can talk more about these sustainability issues that event planners should consider when hosting their events or what they should think about that they might not, you know, think about when planning. Absolutely. Um, Sustainability is, um, it is so difficult in what we do because it's like we're building an entire city in some cases um, and we're building it for a night, you know, or two weeks or three weeks, you know, we are building something uh, not just a society which has a culture and expected behavior, um, which is the safety side of things, but also there's real structure to it. And then what do you do with it when it's done? Especially if it's something that only happens once, maybe once a year or once ever. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we work with folks to just try to reduce the waste. Um, And this is very difficult again right now in the pandemic era. Uh, you know, we were moving towards lots of reuse uh, on items like, you know, if you can't have a bubbler on site instead of water bottles, simple as that. We can yeah. do that now. Everything needs to be single packaged. It, you know, it individually yes. single serving type of things. Yeah. So for the moment, that is very much out the window, but there are still things that you can do to reduce that. Um, but, you know, when you look at sustainability, don't forget things like, your signage or your, um, you know, just your set that you've built or, you know, the tables that you bring in, you know, are you keeping them forever? Are you, um, are you donating them Are you know, and, and thinking about things from, from the side of, okay, I, I only want to do this once, but don't need to reuse any of this. Can you as a company keep it and reuse it for another client? Mm-hmm. Um, and you donate to someone who will reuse it. it we've gotten as granular on things. And this is funny, but um, years ago, uh, Hillary worked on a program where uh, she could not find someone to take all of the building elements that she had on a program. And it was all just going to go into um, the trash and it was killing her. And she ended up finding, of all things, uh, a high school that she could donate everything to. And they turned them all into their, like, all, you know, fall play sets. Oh, that's uh, cool. It is. It really is. And we were so happy to help. Yeah. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, we know that that will probably also continue to be reused again and again in different forms. So it made a lot of sense. And it's, you know, we often look at, at donation is it can be difficult it ends up making you angry sometimes they can't come when you need them to come yeah, they don't respond yeah. as quickly as you would like or they will actually pick over your items and you'll be like gosh you're beggars and choosers but they really <laughs> are so you have to really think yeah. about 
what can be reused and recycled and in what format. And so we found some interesting partners. There's one that's in the Southwest that I love. They they would take um, vinyl banners and they would turn them into sunshades. Or, oh, um, that's so graphics. cool. That's genius. Great. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, so things like that. But then on the flip side of that, um, we also know sometimes it is really close to the same price if you rent versus purchase. But again, if you are not going to be using those things again, maybe rental really is a smarter way to go. Yeah. Um, just, you know, don't mess around with having to get rid of these things or maybe even the carbon footprint of having to transport it somewhere far away to be stored. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of working through all of those. And sustainability can get incredibly granular. You yeah. really can drill down into some of these things. Um, and, you know, is it A or B or C or D that is the right choice yeah. for this moment? Um, but it, it, it takes a lot of work. And that one's, you know, that's also why it's so difficult to get mm -hmm. people to pay attention to it. Because they, you know, we all know as producers, you know, if you have one job, you already have five. Yeah. So, it's so, know, it's so much easier just not think about it, you know, and do the easy route, but it really is. But I think a, a biggest trend, a trend that's emerging, it's been emerging for a while is people are really starting finally to think about our planet and think about our carbon footprint. Yeah. And and they notice your your consumers, customers, guests will notice, if especially if you advertise that, hey, we're a sustainable event, uh, recycle, we don't use plastic, blah, blah, blah. They will notice what you're doing and appreciate exactly. it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it for me, I think that sustainability and safety can go hand in hand in many ways. Um, one of them that I don't like is a lot of people look at both safety and sustainability as just sort of a checklist, like, oh, I just have to fulfill this. Yeah. Check these off. Um, but if you actually truly care about them, it does make it easier um, mm -hmm. to, to institute safety for your people and safety for the earth, you know, just being sustainable. There are ways to make it work without having to feel like, oh, this is just another thing I have to do. Mm hmm. And there's a reward to it. You feel good after you feel good knowing that, you know, you didn't contribute to waste on our planet. That at least you Agreed. minimize what you could. Agreed. So, and but, if in any way you can also sell that to a client as a cost yeah. savings, even better. High five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I really like that you guys focus on sustainability because it's, again, it's so, so important. And finally, we're starting to make our way to where we can, we actually are becoming more aware about it. And so... I right. wanted to just ask you about that because I love yeah. that. I love that you do that. I'm definitely a no plastic person. So that's why I'm like, yeah, I really with the, um, oh gosh, with the pandemic, the, it kills me. I, we have to do it, but it kills me. Like, you know, all the takeout orders or even mm -hmm. when you eat out and you have to throw it away. I'm just like, no, absolutely. <sighs> you know, on the one hand, you really want to save a local business. On the other hand, I know I just show up with some Tupperware. Yeah, I know. Thanks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And now you see the masks everywhere on the ground now. I'm like, oh, oh I know. Breaks your heart. It just breaks your heart. Yeah. So I wanted to touch on that. The other thing I wanted to ask you quickly is because I've talked to you different, I've been talking to different promoters and kind of getting their take on how they are doing health screenings for their guests entering the event space prior to the event. So I wanted to ask if you have seen or found any ways. Um, any health screenings that have proven to be really effective before going to an event or any tips when it comes to conducting health screening at an event? Sure. So the one big tip I would give people that they aren't thinking about or that I've seen most people aren't thinking about and then we have to kind of realign them on is medical records. Um, people are writing things down or writing a name and saying temperature or... Um, hey, so-and-so is vaccinated. I don't need mm -hmm. to worry about this or that. And um, it's it's very unclear right now with OSHA as well as legally what is constituting a medical record. Um, and it may be less so with your audience um, than it is with your employees, actually. So the back of house. Um, and so it, I just cringe when I see people writing down a name and a temperature next to it or something of that nature. And it's very easy to avoid creating these medical records. Yeah. Um, so don't write down things. Just don't, you know, don't put it in an email. Don't put it in a DM. Just don't write things down. I just um, was working with someone this morning 
where um, they wanted someone to be on site. And we said, you know, if they are cleared to do this, not quarantine with this travel, um, because they are vaccinated, we just want to know that they are cleared not to quarantine. We don't want to know. Don't write the words down that they're vaccinated. Like that's just, it's semantics. But again, to be incredibly safe on that side and careful about creating a medical record, um, let's not do it. And they wrote back, you know, great. This person is cleared not to quarantine after travel. And that, so we know, we know in essence, that means they're vaccinated, but we have not written down specific about any sort of medical procedure, which makes very sure not a medical record. Mm -hmm. So they will continue to move forward in defining what does turn into a medical record. But if you are having people at a health check and you're writing down a name and a temperature, that is a medical record. Or um, I have seen people also hire nurses to do their um, health Mm -hmm. screenings and checks. And I understand the inclination to want a medical professional to do it. But when you have a medical professional handling these things that turns it into a medical record. So that is why, for example, my local hospital, um, which is a a nationally recognized institution, um, they actually use, they converted their valets into the people to do the health checks, a building filled with medical professionals Mm -hmm. so that they avoided any sort of whiff of um, creating a medical record. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's very strange and it's, it's definitely one of those. Yeah. We may be erring really far on the side of caution to avoid that. But if you have created a medical record with an employee or an employee, you have to retain that record for mm-hmm. like 30 years, according to mm-hmm. OSHA. Yeah. Yearly. I mean, no, that's wow. good. It's always better to be super cautious, I think. Take the extra step. Exactly. And it's so easy to do everything verbally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Save your time. Save, do the time now to save yourself the time later of dealing with. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. And then my last question before I'll let you go, because I can imagine you're busy is I wanted to quickly (laughs) ask, I'm assuming I wanted to quickly ask about (laughs) crowd control. That's another issue that, and you know, managing social distancing at events if you had any tips or advice when it comes to handling crowd control and where to even start when you, tr- you kind of, maybe it's thinking about your layout or your event design and your space. I know. Right. Okay. So there are some great guidelines about how much square footage you need to have per person for capacity. And that is rapidly changing as mm-hmm. people start to say, Hey, outdoors, you can do this type of capacity and indoors, yeah. you can, no. Um, so, but there are some great, um, there are some great calculations as far as what you, you need to do, what it used to be before people started. Well, when I say it used to be, what it was in, let's say January was 113 square feet per person, um, inside, outside, whatever that may be. Um, it is changing. Um, but that one is a, a good example of what it used to be. Once you then ensure that you have enough space for people, it's the reality of, okay, how do we make them Pay attention to that, though. Yeah, exactly. um, and there is a certain level of you have to, you know, let it go. Uh, yeah. You know, you have to decide how you want to enforce that. Um, so there are, um, we have seen, you know, the pods marked on the ground. We have seen, um, you know, in stadiums where they have the seats um, that fold up, you know, literally sort of locked into place so people can't move around. So they bought a two ticket pod and that's how many people can sit in the Mm -hmm. row or section. We've seen a lot of that. Um, And again, you have to determine how you intend to enforce it. Um, COVID compliance officers, I don't know if you're familiar. I I think most people are now, but they kind of came to us from the film industry um, where they were monitoring sets. Yeah. I'm sure they will eventually be called something else for events um, beyond COVID compliance officer or CCO but I'm just going to use that term right now. And a CCO is really helpful and a CCO staff just to kind of walk around and gently remind people, Hey, you agreed to this. Um, you will be, or Hey, you need to be a part or are you guys in the same household? Things like that. Yeah. Um, I also recommend um, giving people uh, signals within 
you know, kind of in their own crowd. And what I mean with that is I, I always think of the example of um, a music festival. And you think about that and you say, okay, it's a wide open space outdoors. Let's pretend. Yeah. And it's very easy to have sections um, for people that are feeling comfortable and great and want to squish in together a little bit closer. Um, and people that are really uncomfortable and want to be back a little further, giving them their own area and people mm -hmm. that may have, you know, maybe even more uncomfortable than that, or identifying them somehow with a wristband that says, I'm just really not comfortable with this yet. You know, stay away from me. Oh, that's a great idea. A wristband, yeah. the color coding. It, yeah. So color coding that and letting people kind of determine where they want to be in that. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you try your darndest, there will be people that will break it. Um, and you do your, your best to, to kind of provide them what they can do and, and remind them of their obligations. And then it goes back to your identity. Who do you as a festival want to be? Um, do you want to say, hey, if I have to warn you literally once, I will kick you out. Um, if I have to warn you endlessly, I will do that. You know, we will take that on. So mm -hmm. it's it's kind of up to you to decide how you want to do that enforcement. But giving people, I think giving some people the ability to really choose their own adventure, as it were, in a crowd, um, yeah. will make this easier. Yeah. And that's when I think um, communication prior to the event is so important, whether it's on your registration page or your marketing material, letting them know what type of event it's going to be. If it's, if it's going to be, okay, we're extra cautious. We're going to be separating you like this, or it's going to be more relaxed, or you'll have the option to have the wristband and color code it. I think that the communication prior to the event and just, and do it like months out leading up to your event and constantly. So people yeah. know, and they understand how the event's going to be prior before they get there. So either they're not afraid or they're Absolutely. not confused when they get there and someone's telling them, Hey, you need to watch your space. Yeah. And, and, and be consistent in that communication. Yes. Too. You know, don't, don't change it up on them because we all know every time yes. CDC changes something on us, we get confused. So mm -hmm. imagine how they feel then having to drill down into just this one particular event. Yeah. But there's also, you know, you said, you mentioned you were looking at the resources on our site. I don't know if we still have it up. I actually don't remember, but we, we used to have something up, um, noting a, a social responsibility pledge. Have you heard of those? Um, no, actually. They're very interesting. And that is a way to, um, you can do this both with employees as well as with your audience. Employees gets into a whole thing about their legal contract, et cetera. So I will talk about this just sort of focused on the audience, but it's not a legal binding agreement, but you can make them sign a, a social responsibility pledge, noting, I know what the rules are. I'm reading this right now and I'm acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, I'm going to do, you know, I agree to do all of this on here to make everybody here feel safe, to share this experience with them. It does make it a little bit easier in enforcement simply yeah. because, yeah, you signed this. Yeah. You asked you, and then you put signs of it all over the place. And you can remind folks, hey, remember we talked about this? Like, can you just make sure, oh, yeah. a lot of it is just, they're not purposely trying to break it. They just forget, or it's just not, you know, we're all learning this new way to be out in the world. We're all a little weird right now. So it's just allowing people to remind you, you know, yeah. oh, you're right, you're right. I did say that. Great. Thanks. I did see that. Thank you. Yeah. And there's always going to be those people that even the amount, no matter the amount of signs you put out or whether they yeah. sign something or Agreed. not, they're going to be confused. So just be prepared for that. Yeah, they're gonna be what? Confused. Yeah. And, and I, that's one of my things is I always say, Hey, listen, I need a ton of patience on site. You know, it's been, you know, we get back on site and every time it's weird again, you know, it's just like, wow, something really happened to us. And so it's a little bit weird. We're all a little bit wonky right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I need some patience from them and I will extend the same virtue to them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It does take a lot of patience. <laughs> oh, <laughs> bless your soul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can be a lot sometimes, but yeah, it's just so weird. Cause you're right. It is like an awkward thing now, well, especially transitioning more into in-person events where like people, what? exactly What's exactly happening? Just, how do i yeah. act around people it's i know or i did something really weird i was reading something the other day that 
you know, it was just a joke on Twitter, but this woman was saying, I didn't know what to do when my, you know, I went to a restaurant outside and the server came up and introduced her and I told her my name and tried to shake her hand. She, who, who does that? Like, oh. did I forget how to have a server? Like, yeah. how, to, how to interact with someone at a restaurant? So funny. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. People are funny. Yeah. Well, we'll get there. We will. And and before I leave, I did want to ask you more if for people interested that listen and maybe want to get in touch with you guys and work with you guys, what should they do? Should they get in touch with you on your website or, or. Yeah, I think our website's the easiest way. Honestly, if you reach out on the info button on the website, that goes directly to me. Um, So I will answer it myself. Um, But yeah, it's the event ally.com. And you know, there's, there's always a lot of resources there, but that's also, you know, it's the quickest way to find us. Yeah. It looks like you guys have do trainings and you have a bunch of stuff. So yeah, we sure do. We try to offer a lot of resources for folks. Um, yeah. As they have questions, we get a lot of questions that um, we are, I mean, you know, you hear me gabbing on. So we're always happy to talk. To mm-hmm. people. Um, but uh, you know, if they just want to quietly you know, learn a few things on their own time at their, you know, at their own pace, our trainings are a great, mm-hmm. a great way for them to look through things. Yeah. And, um, you know, understand. We do have a live Q&A coming up for the folks that have taken our training in case they want to follow up and do more. So that is always a really nice thing too, for them to yeah. um, uh, get, get some access to us and just pick our brains. We're always around for the folks that need us. Yeah. Well, what you guys are doing is so amazing. It's probably crazy to think um, before, like last year, you probably didn't think you would be where you are today or doing what you're doing, but. No, totally right. Totally right. I actually, I was like, you know, I hate to say it, but I would love to get back to the days where our biggest safety concern was like weather, you know, or (laughs) fire. I know. Now it's a whole new ball game. So, but what you guys are doing is so important. So. It's amazing. Keep it well, thank up. Thank you. Yeah. It was so nice to speak with you. You too. And um, yeah, I look forward to getting this out there and providing the resources to our clients because they're going to really love it and they need it. It's so important. Again, I can't like emphasize that enough. It's so important. <laughs>